Hey, fancy seeing you here again. Can you believe it? I always just want to be comfortable, but this chair doesn't allow for comfort. Hi guys, how are you today? I hope you are having a wonderful day so far. If not, sorry. My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup Monday. If you are new here, every Monday I sit down, I do my makeup and I talk about a true crime case that has been on my brain, AKA my noggin. I'm here every Monday for you. I'm doing it for you. If you like makeup and maybe you have an interest in true crime, I would suggest that you hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, take a lap. Yeah, because it's a good time over here. I mean, is it, I mean, yeah, kind of. I mean, it's sad, but like really quick, my eyelids, don't worry, I'm not sick. I used a red eyeshadow the other day and like stained my eyelid. I love that for me. So today I wanted to have a little chat about the Richardson family. And this story is based out of Medicine Hat, Canada. If you watched last week's episode, I got really hung up on the city names, Elephant Butte and Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. And I was just like, dude, these names, these names, okay? And then a lot of you guys explained to me where these names came from. Very interesting, thank you for that. And then this week, Medicine Hat, I was stuck on it. These city names, man, they're just getting to me. So Medicine Hat, Canada. Let me tell you about it. It's like a little suburb area. A lot of middle-class family lives there, quiet. So the Richardson family was made up of Mark was the father, Deborah was the mother, and then there were two children, Jasmine and Jacob. Jasmine was 12 years old when the story takes place and Jacob was eight years old. Jasmine was attending, um, I think it was an all girls Catholic school. She was known to be a good kid. What can you say about a 12 year old, you know? They're always good until they hit their teenage years. Am I right? But Jasmine was nice. She was a good kid, did well in school. And Jacob, the eight year old, like family friends would say that he was a class clown. He was goofy, just like a typical, typical eight year old, you know? The Richardson family, they were pretty tight knit and they were just a very close loving family. So Jasmine was 12, right? And she was approaching her teenage years. And her parents noticed that she did, she started to change as most do when they hit their teenage years or pre teen years. So when they started to notice just a change in Jasmine's attitude, they didn't really think much of it with Jasmine. Okay, so she had some friends at her Catholic school, right? And she was like a rule follower. And she just, I don't wanna call her a goody two shoes because like, I feel like that's not the right word. She, she was just followed the rules and was a good kid, right? She liked to wear pink or like color and like quote unquote girly things. When she was 12, her parents started to notice a change in her attitude, but then they also noticed a change in her appearance. And it kind of started a little slow, right? So at first it was just like, Jasmine really liked wearing color and pink. And now all of a sudden she seemed to be more interested in darker makeup, the first red flag. Then she started to just mainly want to wear darker clothes, all black. And then Jasmine was more interested in punk rock, the devil's music. So Jasmine and her friends at school, they started to like go their own ways a little bit. They noticed that Jasmine, her interests were changing and she was becoming a little bit of a rebel. Jasmine was showing up to school in all black clothing, fishnets, choker. We got chains, the dark Gothic makeup and jewelry that wasn't allowed at the school. So she started to draw like fake tattoos on her hands and stuff with like a Sharpie marker, but it was like devil stuff. And she's at a Catholic school. So she would get pulled into the office. She would get in trouble. And school officials kind of found themselves really on Jasmine's behind because she wasn't obeying dress code. She was writing stuff all over her body that was like satanic. And Jasmine just started to get in trouble more and more. And it wasn't even because of her schoolwork. She was still doing well in school. It was just that she wasn't following the dress code and she started to have a little sass. The school teachers at the Catholic school, they thought, you know, it was odd because they knew Jasmine as the goody girl. And now she was challenging teachers, giving pushback, snarky remarks. She was just being sassy. So one evening, Jasmine attended a punk rock show. I don't know which one, I try to find it. I'm a curious cat, I've said this before. Meow. I just wanted to know. 
-hmm. Couldn't find it. I don't know if she went with friends or anything, but the only information I could find was that she attended a punk rock show. So while she was there, she met this guy and she sees him at the show. She's like, oh my God, he is so fine. And his name is Jeremy. So Jeremy like showed some interest in Jasmine. He was talking to her. He was making her feel cute, making her feel special. And guess how old Jeremy was? 23. He was 23 at this time, talking to a 12 year old. I don't know about you, but I, I think that's a problem. Jeremy, a little bit about him. He was unemployed. He was a high school dropout. He lived in a not so great neighborhood. What Jasmine really found like appealing about him was, well, first of all, this older man is just like showing interest in her, you know? But also he was just full blown goth kid. He wore, you know, all black. He had eyeliner. It was all smudged and just like, mm. And she just thought, ooh, bad boy. Which side note, I feel like this needs to be talked about just in general, because I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this, but when I was in high school, I remember high school students, like my fellow classmates, they would be talking about how they were dating like an 18 year old. I remember one girl was dating a 20 year old. And at the time, a lot of us were like, oh my God, she's so cool. She's dating like an older man. Wow, oh my gosh. And now looking back, I'm like, Huh? If you are in high school, you do not need to be dating older men. And if older men are dating young high schoolers, like that's gross. And I never really thought about that until recently. And I was like, wait a minute. It's not cool to date an older guy. Well, I'm dating an older guy, but like when you're a kid, it's not cool. So just don't. Okay, that's my one piece of advice. Just don't do it. Anyways, I'm getting off track. Okay, so at this show, Jasmine gives Jeremy, her new friend, her phone number. And the two start hanging out secretly. Jasmine would tell her parents that she was like going to her friend's house or something to study. She was going out. She was sneaking out to go see this Jeremy guy. But when they couldn't hang out, they would stay in touch by messaging each other like on chat website. They also had MySpace, other social media sites. This was 2006, my apologies. Back to Jeremy, the guy she met. He would wear a vial of blood around his neck. Like it was, a necklace, right? And it had a little vial. And he said that there was blood in there. And he would brag all the time to Jasmine that he loved the taste of blood and he needed it to survive. And she's like, why is that? Why do you need to survive? Oh my God, are you a vampire? No, he's not a vampire, but guess what he is? So Jeremy tells Jasmine, this part made me laugh cry and I'm sorry for laugh crying, but it was hilarious to me. So Jeremy tells Jasmine that he's a 300 year old werewolf. And when Jasmine heard this, she was like, wow. 300 year old werewolf who drinks blood, sign me up. I feel bad for this Jeremy guy because he's 23 and he just kind of seems very lost in the world. But again, Jasmine is 12 years old. When you are a teenager or have that adolescent brain, that is the dumbest brain you will ever have in your whole life. You have no common sense. Jasmine and Jeremy, they were sexually active as well. So she kind of started to just act different too. A couple months after meeting Jeremy, that's when Jasmine becomes full blown gothic. She was in it deep now. She was committed. A lot of Jasmine's older friends would say that they became afraid of her. They were scared of her. Dressing scary, she would draw like little crosses and stuff on her forehead. They said that she was just quote, weird. That's what they said, I'm not saying she, weird. Jasmine said that she liked the idea of scaring people because it made her feel powerful and like in charge. And Jeremy just became the center of her world. She was infatuated. So Jasmine, she would spend a lot of her time on like MySpace, it was on this website called vampirefreaks.com, but it's pretty similar to MySpace, social media platform where you have friends, you can talk to people, you can leave comments, pictures, all that jazz, but I guess mainly targeted towards the vampires of the world, I think. Doesn't matter. On Jasmine's MySpace profile, her heroes used to be her mom and her dad and like God, and now she had changed her hero section to Marilyn Manson and Jeffrey Dahmer. Another red flag for the parents, like, ooh, on vampire freaks.com on her like about me or, or where you describe yourself. She described herself as bisexual, a Wiccan. And it's like this big fat long list of stuff, but like let's pick and choose. Wiccan, awkward, loud, a deep thinker and insane. She listed her interests as unnatural hair colors, dark poetry, blood and kinky shit. Jeremy was so like heavily on that website. That was like his main go-to website. And that's where 
they would communicate most of the time. So Jeremy's profile, his about me section also very long. He said that he liked skateboarding, mosh pits, loud music tattoos, kinky fetishes, Chris Angel. Who likes Chris Angel? That would be my red flag. Not the point, Bailey. So Jasmine kept the relationship hidden. You can't let your family know that you're dating a 23 year old werewolf. And then finally, Jasmine's parents, they like go look at her social media and they see like that she loves somebody and they kind of connect the dots. They find out that she sneaking out or just like not coming home, that just pissed them off. Her parents just, they finally had to do something. She was being disrespectful. She was acting more rebellious. Jasmine wasn't respecting their household, their rules. They told Jasmine, you have to stop seeing this guy. Like you can't be seeing him. He's way older than you. They told her that she's no longer allowed to see Jeremy, not allowed to leave the house unless she's going to school. No ifs, ands, or buts. And of course, this just caused Jasmine to lose, lose it completely. And she just acted out even more. She rebelled even more. And basically that started a war in the house. So Jeremy and Jasmine, they would still communicate online and that was now the main way that they talked. And Jasmine would be the one who proposed that Jeremy maybe gets rid of the problem. She wrote to Jeremy, which later they were able to pull these records, but she wrote to Jeremy, quote, I have this plan. It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. Very suspicious. And then Jeremy would go on to write, quote, their throats I want to slit. They will regret the shit they have done. Finally, there shall be silence. Their blood shall be my payment, end quote. And Jeremy wrote this in response. <laughs> and she would constantly express to Jeremy how much she hated her family. She just wanted them gone because they were the reason why they couldn't be together. So then on the evening of April 23rd, 2006, it's nighttime, okay? It's quiet suburban street. Everybody's in bed or at least getting ready for bed. But Deborah, the mom, she heard some noises downstairs. She puts on her robe and she goes downstairs to investigate, goes to turn on the light. She was met with a man wearing a mask, holding a knife. So naturally she starts screaming. She ends up getting attacked by this intruder and Deborah, poor Deborah, she was stabbed 12 times times over and over and over again. And she's just screaming the whole time because she's screaming. She woke up everybody in the house. Her husband, Mark, or Jasmine's dad comes downstairs to see what's going on. That's where he sees this man over his wife, just going at it, like stabbing, just stabbing her and just blood everywhere. Oh my gosh. I couldn't even imagine like seeing, especially the one you love, your partner being attacked. So Mark reacts and he grabs a tool that was close by. I think it was a screwdriver or something. He like grabs it and he's trying to like fight this guy that's on top of his wife. And he's trying anything he can. He's punching him, he's trying to stab him. And he's sadly though, he doesn't win the fight. He ended up being stabbed a total of 24 times, which resulted in Mark's death. Jasmine was like upstairs in her room or something pretending to sleep. So upstairs next to Jasmine's room is her younger brother's room. So the little boy, he's eight and he woke up because of all the ruckus. He's scared. So he's like hiding in his room on his bed. And so then Jasmine comes running into the room. So then she's putting her hands over her brother's ears and just like protecting him from the loud screaming that's happening. And it's so stupid because then Jasmine's boyfriend comes upstairs after just, he just killed the both parents, right? He comes upstairs. Instead of Jasmine just saying like, hey, maybe, you know, we don't kill my brother. Let's not do it. He's a little kid, he's only eight. No, Jasmine instead is the one who decided Jacob, her eight-year-old brother, he had to go. She's completely heartless. So her reasoning for having to get rid of her younger brother was because both of his parents were dead now. So what was the point? He wouldn't have anybody. And she was ready to start her new life with Jeremy. So this poor eight year old little boy, Jasmine is the one who ends up stabbing her brother five times. And then on top of that, just to make sure that he is indeed dead, she slits his throat. Like what the hell? How do you do that? I was reading this and I was just like, dude, I hate them. I hate them. Okay, so that same evening when the murders took place, a six-year-old little boy, he was a neighbor. He came over to the Richardson's house because he wanted to um, ask Jacob if he wanted to come outside and play with him. So he's knocking on the door. 
Meow. He's waiting. So he kind of like peeks through the window by the front door. When this little boy peeks through the window, he sees some shit. So this poor little boy, traumatized forever, he sees just blood everywhere and then body on the floor. So he went running home just screaming and he tells his parents, I think they go over to the house to look and then the police are called. So the police come over to the home. When they walk into the house, the police see just a nightmare. I guess that there was just blood everywhere. Okay, just every. Where? What a hard job, huh? You kind of forget. They gotta see some really fucked up shit. Bailey, stop cussing. The investigators in the house searching everything. So they, they had no idea what happened, right? They're thinking, what is this? Like domestic abuse, um, a burglary gone wrong. So when they go into Jacob's room and they see like his his throat is cut. Investigators are like, okay, this is somebody who had to know the family. Like this is personal. So one of the officers inside of the home, he notices a family portrait that was like hanging on the wall. And he sees, okay, we have the mom, the dad, the brother, and then the daughter. Hmm. Police think that the 12 year old daughter had been kidnapped by the killer. So they put out an Amber Alert, hoping that somebody somebody will find the missing daughter. Just hours after the murders, police go down to the school of Jasmine to search her school locker. And they're hoping to find any types of clues, looking for signs, anything. So they're going through Jasmine's locker. Right away, they find a drawing that gives everybody the creeps. But it's like stick drawings, very creative, but it's like a drawing of a house with stick figures inside the home. And then the home's on fire and it looks like the stick figures were on fire as well. Then there are like two stick figures running away from the home that's on fire next to a car and above it says ha ha Like they had gotten away from the fire or maybe set the fire, just looking at all sorts of stick figure evil. So once they found that drawing, investigators looked at the missing girl Jasmine from a missing person to now a murder suspect. I mean, this drawing was super suspicious. They're like, why is this girl drawing this evil thing? What looks to be two stick figures that represent her and somebody else set in this house on fire, which resembles or looks like, or could be her family home. You know, they gotta put the pieces together. Police investigators go looking for Jasmine and it doesn't even take them that long to find her. Now I couldn't exactly find how they found her, like how they, did somebody tip them off or what happened, but they ended up finding both Jasmine and Jeremy within the like first 24 hours. And they were about a hundred miles away in the town called Leader and they were placed under arrest. Now when they were being arrested, police, they, they said like, they didn't display any grief or sadness, they didn't seem concerned at all. And Jeremy, he bragged about his eye cause he had like a, a black eye. Jeremy said that Mark, Jasmine's father, the father had punched him in the face and he was kind of like laughing about it. So first with Jasmine and her trial, her trial began in June of the following year. So at her trial, Jasmine was asked why she murdered her parents and her little brother. And Jasmine said, quote, I I loved Jeremy so much. I thought it was going to bring us closer together, end quote. So then evidence was brought in and this evidence was a stack of jailhouse letters exchanged between Jasmine and Jeremy after their arrest. So when they were in prison, they were writing one another. There were tons of letters. And in one of those letters, Jasmine joked that they were legends and immortal. Neither Jasmine or Jeremy mentioned any guilt or remorse for what they did. It was more of them just planning their future together as if they were gonna get out of prison tomorrow. I keep having to remind myself over and over again like that she's only 12 at this time. So she just has no idea, like she killed her family and she's in prison. And in another letter from Jasmine, they brought forward as evidence, it said, quote, never has a person affected me so much. Always will there be something missing without you with me. My lawyer tells me we're legends. Ha, huh. closer to immortality, it would seem. So then they bring in another letter from Jeremy and it says, quote, I love you more than life itself. I've added you to my visitors list. So once you're released, please visit often. Never forget how much I care or that I love you. Without you, this life isn't worth living. You said you want to get engaged, question mark. Then here's a question. Will you marry me? If so, then it's a verbal agreement. So pretty much he was asking her to marry him. Sounds great, okay. And then in her response letter, she said, yes, 
this is quotes. Yes, yes, I will, I would love to. And then she said, the world really is against us. <laughs> Rao, end quote. Roar, row? Side note, because I remember the MySpace kids using that word, row, roar. I never understood it. It was always the scene kids. Row. I'm gonna Google it, hold on. Roar, that means I love you in dinosaur. Anyways, I saw all the scene kids always using that word. I never got it. No, can't relate. Anyways, she, yeah, she said that to him in a letter, so whatever. So again, in these letters, they never mention any guilt or remorse over the crimes, instead focusing on their relationship and how being in prison seemed to be a temporary setback. Jasmine took the stand in her own defense on July 3rd, 2007. During her testimony, she told the court that she had a hypothetical conversation about killing her family and possibly making the deaths look like a murder, suicide, or an accident, but never intended on actually going through with it. And then when questioned about the letters to Jeremy, she said she was referring to her five minutes of fame, that people are gonna remember them forever. I mean, they, they seem to like the idea of that, Jasmine said she was home when the murders took place, that she was upstairs in her brother's room trying to cover his ears so he wouldn't hear their parents screaming. She then said that Jeremy came upstairs into the brother's room and yelled at her to kill her brother and that she had to do it because he just killed her parents for them. So she needed to participate. Jasmine would go on to say that she stabbed him, but quote, not very hard. She pled not guilty to all three counts of first degree murder, but after just three hours of deliberation on July 10th, 2007, the jury found her guilty on all three counts. She was sentenced, get this, wait, let me do my lip liner because this is serious. Canada is for the people. She was sentenced to only 10 years of imprisonment, the maximum sentence allowed by the Youth Criminal Justice Act, which states that convicts who are under the age of 14 at the time they committed the act cannot be charged as an adult and can only be given a maximum sentence of 10 years years. When I first heard this, I was like, what? It, it, uh. So she got a credit for 18 months for the time that she had already served while waiting for her uh, trial. And then four of those years out of the 10 years, those were going to be spent in a psychiatric facility. She would do four and a half years under conditional supervision in the community. So a lot of people were outraged. I should put on lipstick because I probably look crazy, huh? A lot of people are outraged. The Canadian law is set up to rehabilitate people, to help them and to not necessarily necessarily punish them. I mean, obviously, if you don't know this, I don't live there. So I'm sure there are a lot of arguments about this and how it all works. But based from like me and somebody on the outside looking in, kind of sounds nice. <laughs> Before you start yelling at me, put those fingers down. When you think about how we work here in the US, they don't care about actually helping and like fixing people or treating people for a mental illness or setting them up for like success beyond prison. Pretty much out here in the US, it's like they just lock you up and they throw away the key. They treat you like shit. I don't know. I just thought like, oh, at least they're trying to kind of like give her a chance, but it should be case by case, you know, like with her case, I don't know, man, moving on. So Jeremy, the boyfriend who killed the mom and dad, his trial was in December of 2008. He was just straight up found guilty of three counts of first degree murder and sentenced to three concurrent life sentences in prison. He will be up for parole after serving 25 years. I was about to say, well, it's kind of not fair that she only got 10 years, but I don't know, I'm kind of torn on this one. Like they both did a very, very awful thing. Anyways, so in 2012, Jeremy, he changed his name to Jackson May and he tried to appeal his case, but he failed, which is so strange to me. Like I didn't even know you could, you could change your name in prison. I'm just learning all sorts of new things. Oh, guess what though? So in 2015, Jasmine, she completed her sentence and was fully released at the age of 20. She's been keeping a very low profile since her release. If she can go five years without any legal altercations, her juvenile record will be expunged. 
AKA erased, like it never existed. So Jasmine, she got the crown of Canada's youngest convicted murderer at age 12. Congratulations, Jasmine. Yeah, that's inappropriate, but like what? She's 12, what the fuck? So it's pretty uncertain though. There's no like clear reports um, indicating that Jasmine and Jeremy are still a couple, that they got married. Nobody really knows. I doubt it, but who knows? So then there's another side, people standing up for Jeremy. There are a lot of people behind Jeremy saying he shouldn't have received such a harsh sentence compared to Jasmine. He came from a very abusive upbringing. And it's also said that Jeremy has severe FAS what would be considered distinct facial characteristics popular amongst fetal alcohol syndrome sufferers. Part of this condition is severely impaired judgment, meaning that Jeremy didn't have the full mental capacity to fully understand what he was doing and just followed along with what Jasmine told him or suggested he did. And that Jasmine is the one who manipulated him into killing her family. I don't know, cause I don't wanna say like he should be released. Cause at the end of the day, he, he didn't like just stab him one or two times. He he went for it. Kind of scary. I don't know. This is your fight, Canada, not mine. We have pretty bad people here, whatever. And that is the story about the Richardson family. Rest in peace to Mark, Deborah, and Jacob. You know, their lives were taken for no goddamn reason. And on that note, they should remain in prison because that, I just feel bad that Jeremy's still in prison while Jasmine just was like, okay, thanks, bye. And then got to go on to college. I guess she got a scholarship when she was in prison. She got a scholarship to go to college. Let me know your thoughts about this case down below. Do you think Jasmine should be out? I mean, I was trying to find like, an update of where is she now? I found like a YouTube video and some people think it's her as an adult, but you can't really tell. Plus I'm sure she doesn't even wanna be associated with what she did. I will say this though, when I was reading about this case and like trying to get all the info, all that good stuff, the one thing I could not find, and I looked high, I looked low, I still could have missed it cause I'm not perfect. And the one thing I could not find was an apology. Not once did I see or read something where like Jasmine maybe cried and said, I'm so sorry, I understand what I did. And maybe she did in private, she doesn't have to do it publicly, but if you have such a public murder trial and stuff, you think you would do it just to get forgiveness from your community, right? Again, she could have apologized and I just missed it. Maybe she changed her name too and she just didn't announce it like Jeremy. I think if there's anything to take away from this case, I don't know because Jasmine's family, they seem like to do everything kind of right. I don't know what they could have done differently besides like lock her up. And this is why I don't want kids because they are the devil. They're already hard to raise. Now you gotta be all worried that they're gonna murder you. Like, come on, when do you get a break? Oh, I know, parents. Make sure to be checking on what your kids are doing. Check their phones, check in with them on social media. Make sure they're not talking to any werewolves and stuff like that, okay? Okay, tell them I sent you <laughs> if they are asking you why. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Make good choices. And I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.